Yay, come join us. Uh, so I just wanted to mention real quickly, you can go to um, nduniverse.org and actually all of the Universe Revealed lecture series that we've been doing over the past year are there. And so if you've missed any or you want to catch up, you can go there and get them. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Deb Marr. I'm in the Department of Biology at Indiana University South Bend, and I'm going to serve as moderator tonight. Um, the Universe, how many of you have been to a Universe Revealed lecture series before? Ooh, about half, yay, half new, half, half uh, experienced. Um, so uh, the Universe Reveal lecture series, we feature current research and opportunities to be curious about ourselves, um, our universe, and our world. This year we're branching out, not only doing all fields of science, but we're also bringing in music. Um, and so at the end, I'll talk about some of the upcoming lectures um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so tonight, let's see, uh, we are going to talk about the 2023 Nobel Prizes. Um, and I wanted to, uh, first I wanted to thank our three presenters. Uh, so Masaru Ken Kuno, uh, he will be talking about the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Kirk Mecklenburg will be talking about the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. And then Peter Stepanov will be talking about the Nobel Prize in Physics. Each of them have expertise in this area, um, and so we will learn more. Um, I just wanted to give you a real quick history of the Nobel Prizes. So Alfred Nobel um, lived from 1833 to 1896. In his last will, he donated a major chunk of his estate to start the Nobel Prizes. The first five Nobel Prizes, um, so since it took a few years after his death to get things up and running about how the Nobel Prizes were going to be awarded. And it's actually quite an elaborate process. Um, they are awarded in physics, chemistry, medicine or physiology, literature and peace. Those areas were chosen because he liked them. So this is his personal preference. He wrote poetry on the side. That's why literature is in there. And then, of course, he was very interested in peace. Um, in 1969, they added the Nobel Prize in economics. That's because Sweden did something major with their bank in 1968, and so that Nobel Prize in economics is actually awarded outside of the Nobel Prize account um, in a different area. Um, so the, as stipulated in his will, the Nobel Prize, it goes to those who have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind as judged by the people on the mystery committees. Um, so between 1901 to 2023, 621 Nobel Prizes have been awarded. Um, they've been awarded to 965 individuals and 27 organizations. The Peace Prize is often given to an organization, sometimes to an individual, but sometimes to an organization. Most of the science prizes have all been given to individuals. One of the rules that is stipulated is that the prize cannot be shared by more than three people. That's it. Um, and then the laureates receive a gold medal, a diploma, um, and then this year it happens to be 11 million a Swedish kroner, uh, which is about 1 million in US. It fluctuates with interest. So last year, if you got the Nobel Prize, you only had 880,000 uh, in US dollars. So this is a good year to get the prize. Um, so we will start right off with Ken Kuno, and he's going to talk about the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. We're going to go into the world of quantum dots. All right, thank you. Thank you for coming and having me here. So I want to tell you about the Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2023 for the discovery and synthesis of quantum dots, and the folks that won it are shown right here. Hopefully this is a, Deb, is this a laser pointer? Yes, the top. The top one? Okay, it's very weak. So the first person here is Munji Bowendi, okay? And I know Munji personally simply because I was a student. I was one of his first students, and I joined the third year he was a professor at MIT. And the second person is Louis Bruce. Now, you should understand that Louis Bruce is actually uh, the mentor of Munji Bowendi. That is, when Munji was a younger scientist, he was a postdoctoral scholar with Lou Bruce, who worked at the time at Bell Labs. Are folks familiar with Bell Labs? It's where the transistor was discovered in 1947. And so it's a very famous place, and Lou Bruce was a scientist there. Now, at the same time, there was a Russian scientist named Alexei Ekimov. He was from St. Petersburg, 
And he worked at this place called the Yoffa Institute, uh, and that's a very famous place for making, or at least studying semiconductor physics. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Alexei, simply because, although I agree um, that these three folks should have won the Nobel Prize and have won the Nobel Prize, there's a lot of other folks, and Deb has alluded to that, there's a lot of other folks that really contributed to the discoveries that won the Nobel Prize, but cannot be awarded, uh, they can't be awarded the Nobel Prize. So Alexei, he was part of a larger group, okay, and that included theorists like Sasha Efros. Uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they all left. And so Alexei came to the United States, and he ended up working at a small company or startup company started by a former Phillips uh, scientist, okay? Now, at the same time, his colleague, Sasha Efros, who did a lot of the theory or theoretical work behind the discoveries that I'll tell you a little bit about, he went to Germany. So he escaped to Germany, and from Germany, he eventually came to the United States and works at the Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C. Sasha Efros is very seminal in this area, but he cannot be awarded the Nobel Prize. At the same time, Louis Bruce had another postdoctoral scholar, in addition to Munji, named Paul Olivasados. If you're familiar with the University of Chicago, Paul Olivasados is currently the president of the university. He is very important in popularizing or making uh, quantum dots well known, but again, not awarded the Nobel Prize. But he made major contributions. So you should understand that this is really a group effort. All right, so next, having introduced the folks, I want to put things into context. Now, the whole message that I want to tell you today is that size matters. So I think you'll remember that size matters. Or, if you wish, small is beautiful. Yes? Okay. So I'm from Notre Dame, so I got to tell you a little bit about the school. And if you look at the main building and the Golden Dome, you'll see that it's got you know, a pretty impressive size. And so I'm using feet, but in science we use uh, SI units or, uh, well, SI units. So I'm going to use meters here. So this is like 36 meters, including the Statue of Mary. Now, if you move to progressively smaller things, and I'm going to use Rudy as an example, as played by Sean Austin, Rudy's like 1.6 meters tall. If you keep going to smaller things, we'll come, go to the human hair. Human hair is about 100 microns, or in meters, it's like a bunch of zeros and a one, okay? And if you keep going down, this is a so-called nano guitar. It's not really a nano guitar, but it's a guitar that some, uh, some engineers, I believe at Cornell University, carved out of a chunk of silicon using a technique called electron beam lithography. It's basically a way to sort of shave away, you know, pieces of the semiconductor to get you a shape. And in this case, they decided for fun to do a guitar. I don't know why. I'm going to skip over here to the realm of chemistry and physics. Now, you're all familiar with atoms. You've already seen this in high school, grade school, elementary school, and you, you know this deep down. We have uh, atoms. We have molecules that are collections of atoms, and we know that they have these different properties. This is the traditional realm of chemistry and physics. So most folks make molecules and study atoms and so forth. However, it's in this intermediate size regime between the sort of engineering regime, where you're doing things like carving out stuff, and this truly atomic and molecular size regime, where we have what's called the quantum regime. And what's special about the quantum regime is that you, the scientist, the engineer, the layperson, you can actually control the properties of matter by just physically changing the size of the objects that you make. And so that gives you the opportunity to go beyond whatever nature gave you. So for example, if I have an atom of silicon, I can't really change the properties of silicon, right? I mean, maybe I can like change it you know, using some kind of radioactivity to transmute it to another element, but I can't really change the properties. But with these particles, which I'm going to talk about today now, these are called quantum dots, these are literally artificial atoms that you can change the properties. And if you have artificial atoms, I want you to think about whether you can make artificial molecules, right? Take two of these artificial molecules, to, uh, atoms together, combine them and make an artificial molecule. And if you keep going, you'll make an artificial solid. And if you have an artificial solid, you can start to play games and really control matter. And so that's the promise of nanoscience and nanotechnology. So quantum dots are the beginning of this dream, if you will. So what do quantum dots look like? Uh, as you already um, probably imagined, if it's an artificial atom, it's probably something that looks like a sphere. It doesn't have to be. It can be a cube. But basically, it's a very small chunk of semiconductor in a spherical-like shape. 
I'm showing you actual photographs of lead selenide. This is a semiconductor that has lead and selenium in it. But these are lead selenide quantum dots, and you can see they're quite small. This is five nanometers, or five times 10 to the negative nine meters. That's a lot of zeros after the decimal point. All right, and what you're seeing, these lines, that's not an artifact. Those are literally the rows of atoms that are making up that particle. And what's beautiful about this is that by controlling the size of this particle, I can begin to control the amount of light it absorbs, the color of light it absorbs, and how it behaves. I begin to control matter. Here's a depiction from Wikipedia, and here's another depiction from another paper. Here's some examples of the quality control that people have these days in terms of these artificial atoms. You can make ensembles, and by that I mean collections. Many, many of these quantum knots where the size of the quantum knots are mostly the same. Can I address any comments or questions at this point? No? I'll keep going. Now, I want to tell you how you make these quantum knots. So if you're, a, Peter, I'm going to slam physics a little bit. If you're a physicist <laughs> or an engineer, yeah, if you're a physicist or an engineer, you have this sort of fascination with stainless steel. So you're going to go and buy something very large and very commercial. It'll cost you about a million just to get into the game, and it's called a molecular beam epitaxy machine. So there, at Notre Dame, there's these machines lying around. And in this, in this, with this machine, you can actually make these quantum dots. Now, I'm a chemist or materials chemist, and so I'm going to use something much, much you know, decidedly more simple. And if you look here, this is literally glassware that you can buy. For example, if you, you know, do any kind of home brewing, you might use some of this uh, sort of apparatus, if you will, temperature controller. It's just literally a thermometer, a three-neck glass flask, a condenser if you want. You don't need it. And then literally you have a stir plate to just mix things. And if you look at the cost, it's only about, what, $1,600? And then just to sort of uh, highlight MasterCard, you know, the fact that I can do better than this, it's priceless. Okay? <laughs> All right. So what can I make? So as I suggested, if I control the size, size matters, if I control the size of those little spherical particles, I control how they behave. I control the color that they absorb and they emit. So for example, these are vials of cadmium selenide. This won my advisor the Nobel Prize. So the synthesis for how to make these gives you different sizes where this is a larger size, and as you make smaller sizes, you get different colors like green. And if you keep going, you'll get blue. What I'm showing you over here is what's called the absorption and emission spectra of these particles. The blue lines is the absorption, how they absorb light, and the red is essentially the emission or the color or energy that it emits. You can see that depending upon the size, these are in angstroms, but you can think of that in nanometers. As the size increases, the color, the red lines, move to lower energies. So I go from, let's say, green to red as I move from right to left, okay? So you control that. And you see these bumps here? These are different transitions. That is, atoms have specific energies that they like to absorb, and the quantum dots are no different. So there are these discrete transitions. Now, the fact that there's a sort of broad smearing out of these lines is just a reflection of what's called the size distribution. So as chemists, we try to be really good and try to make all the particles the same size. But as you can already guess from looking at that, we're not perfect. So some sizes are a little bit larger, some sizes are smaller, and this is what's called a size distribution. So the color is not perfect, and so consequently everything is absorbing a little bit more broad than you might have wanted to. All right, so next, you can not just make uh, lead selenide, you can make CAD selenide and other things. You can even make metal nanoparticles. These aren't really quantum dots, they're called nanocrystals, or you know, par you know, little particles made of metals. But you can see the quality of the particles. Pretty much all of them are the same size. And people have begun to arrange them to start to make these artificial solids. Here are more examples, CAD selenide, telluride, mercury sulfide, and so forth. And you can start to see that these particles are pretty much all the same size. The size distribution, like I said previously, is very, very small or very good. And so here the dream is that this particle or this quantum dot or artificial atom begins to talk to its neighbor. If it talks to its neighbor, it can basically become an artificial solid. And that's one of the dreams. Here's another example on the right 
Uh, these are magnetic quantum knots. These are made of iron platinum. This work was done by Chris Murray. So remember, I joined Munji Buweni's group, but there was an older student named Chris Murray who eventually went to IBM. And at IBM, they wanted to make better hard drives with a bigger uh, you know, information density. So they thought that if they made these quantum knots with these magnetic particles, that they could store information or ones and zeros on them. So here's an example of work done at IBM for hard drive applications. Okay, so now I told you about the promise of these dots and that size matters, right? And I showed you the different colors that arise because of the sizes. So where has this transcended basic science and moved into your real life or everyday life? So if you go to Best Buy, and I was at Best Buy yesterday for other reasons, but if you go to Best Buy, chances are you've seen things from Samsung or LG like these QLED t televisions. There's two technologies out there today. So plasma's gone, so we, no one buys plasma TVs, but you can buy a QLED TV or you can buy an OLED TV, right? That's organic light emitting diode. So these are two competing technologies, just like Betamax and VHS. Does anyone old enough to remember that? Okay. <laughs> All right, that shows you how old I am. All right, so there's a format war going on. QLEDs uses, as the name suggests, quantum dots. Now, how does it work? Here's a sort of a anatomy of these quantum dot televisions. The point is that there's a backlit uh, element there where it's putting out blue light. And when it puts out blue light, the quantum dots absorb this blue light. And because the quantum dots have different sizes, different size quantum dots emit different colors. And that's how you're gonna get your red greens and blues, okay? So this is a process in science that's called down conversion, okay? All it means is that you're going down in energy. So blue light has a higher energy, green, red, uh, and so forth has a lower energy. So again, by using different size quantum dots, you can get different colors to get these sort of like nice rendering uh, on, on the television screen. The other place where quantum dots may have a future, okay, this is sort of an open question, is in biology or in medicine. So when you have, you know, biological specimens, sometimes they're hard to see. So what biologists, and Kirk, I'm going to have to defer to you. <laughs> see, I, I haven't taken biology since, what, high school? <laughs> so you, you'll correct me when I'm wrong. It's hard to see them, right? So you'll use a microscope. But one of the ways that biologists and other scientists study biological specimens is to stain them. And the way they stain them is they put things that either have different colors or they emit different colors. And here's an example where we're taking these quantum dots and using them as so-called fluorescent tags. You shine light, they emit light. And so here they're emitting red light, green light, and they have these different so-called fluorescent beads, which are just collections of different size quantum dots emitting different colors. And so you can start to see things like the nucleus and the cytoplasm areas of a cell and so forth. And the reason why these quantum dots may have a use in biological imaging or tagging applications is because the converse, right, the opposite situation where you use molecules, excuse me, like this, if you can use an organic molecule, you can do the same thing. The problem is that these are organic things. And so consequently, they're a little bit more fragile than a big semiconductor that's made of many different atoms. So the quantum dots are a little bit more robust or resistant to so-called fading effects than are these molecules. And that's why people might prefer them in the future. So I think that's it. I don't have anything else to say other than I had the privilege when I was young, I'm not so young anymore, to be in the same room as when the Nobel Prize work was done I don't say that I did the exact work that got my advisor the Nobel Prize, other than I was a witness to history. And so I hope I've taught you something or convinced you that the area is interesting and perhaps worthy of that Nobel. So thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to try to describe the, uh, some of the science behind the, um, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, given to uh, Weissman and Carrico. Uh, and uh, the award was given for their uh, development of uh, mRNA vaccines. So um, I'm guessing probably a lot of you 
uh, have already had the shot and uh, maybe have this uh, mRNA vaccine in you. So if you've, if you've had the uh, Moderna, oh, just recently? I just got mine too a little while ago, but the Moderna shot or the Pfizer, or, uh, both were this uh, mRNA technology. And uh, I have to say, I, I teach uh, immunology, and for uh, most of the years that I've been doing that, um, when it came to uh, looking at vaccines and mRNA, I, I wouldn't even talk about it because I thought it was so improbable that this would ever really work. And, uh, and that's partly because uh, in the lab I work a lot with RNA, and RNA is really unstable. And so um, uh, it breaks down very quickly into nucleotides. And so the thought of shooting RNA into a person's arm and having it actually do anything never made any sense to me. And so I wouldn't even bother to talk about it with my students. Um, and also, uh, if RNA does get inside of a cell, uh, it's greeted by these receptors that will actually degrade it. So it's part of what's called the innate immune system. And so you're, um, these cells, cells just don't like foreign RNA uh, uh, because viruses uh, are made up of RNA and DNA. And so if those uh, RNA or DNAs get into a cell, a cell automatically sees it as a target, and so they'll degrade them. So that, that's made me think that this would never work, and it makes me um, uh, think about uh, Weissman here with this uh, sort of a, an, an I told you so sort of a smile, <laughs> is that, uh, he, uh, that they, they actually did get it to work, and so now, of course, I will uh, talk about it uh, with my students. Um, but to see sort of the, what a big giant leap this mRNA technology is, which I'm going to describe, uh, I thought I'd compare it to um, a typical sort of um, uh, other vaccine, uh, sort of a, a more normal vaccine. So uh, last Friday I went down to Martin's and got my uh, flu shot. And so I asked the pharmacist for the box that the shots come in, and, and they gave it to me. So I took the box uh, back to ISB and flattened it out and put it on the scanner, and so that's the, uh, what the box looks like. And, and basically what, what these, the way, the traditional way of making uh, vaccines uh, included, uh, like what the CDC does for uh, influenza, is that they, they go out and they look at the different viruses that are circulating uh, around the world. And then they predict which ones they think, which strains they think are gonna attack uh, people in North America. So they collect those four strains, they collect them from people's sneezes or their mucus or whatever from people that have that virus. Uh, and then they, they take the virus and they grow them up in, in uh, uh, fertilized eggs. So that's what's shown here is that the, uh, they're injecting the virus into these eggs. And viruses actually um, are, not, are not really alive, they're just molecular structures. And so they need cells to grow. And so this virus grows uh, in these egg cells. And so you can grow lots and lots of virus uh, uh, to make vaccines for millions and millions of people, but it takes months and months to, to grow them up in, in this sort of format. So those are the four strains uh, I haven't read there that were in, uh, in uh, this year's um, uh, influenza virus. You also see that they, they take the virus then that's been grown in the eggs and you can't go shooting live virus into people because uh, that will give them the virus, right? So, or that will make them sick. So typically they, uh, they, the virus is inactivated chemically. So, uh, so many of the vaccines that we get are, are this viruses that are grown up, inactivated, and then shot into your arm. And by inactivated, they're, they're not gonna infect you, but they're gonna uh, uh, show themselves to your uh, immune system. So this is the, the sort of traditional way to do it. And you can see it takes months and months and lots of labor uh, to get to this point. And, and what these, uh, uh, these guys decided to do was, was to um, instead just make uh, uh, RNA that codes for parts of the virus. And so uh, RNA that ends up coding for protein is called messenger RNA. So messenger RNA codes for protein, ribosomal RNA codes for ribosomes, tRNA co codes for transfer RNAs. So these messenger RNAs then will code for protein. And, and I thought I'd show you a little background about, this is the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that uh, causes uh, COVID. So this is the culprit from our pandemic. And so the pandemic mercifully is, is winding down now. But if you look at the virus under a TEM, uh, you'll see these spikes. And these spikes uh, are shown here uh, in color. And uh, the uh, people that first looked at this thought that this reminded them of a crown. So that's why the crown is, that's why they're called coronaviruses because uh, corona means crown. So the coronaviruses uh, then um, have these spike proteins and that's the key to the, the messenger RNA. So the messenger RNA is gonna code for uh, that protein. Uh, 
Okay? And, and, and typically what happens is the spike protein, um, so this is a viral particle, and the virus isn't alive, but the virus, this virus has a, a membrane around it. Not all viruses do. Uh, and it has an RNA molecule as a genome. So it's an RNA virus. Uh, and then it has a spike protein. And, and typically, the spike protein is, is visible to your immune system. So if that virus gets in you and you have antibodies, the antibodies will bind to the spike protein and, 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 and mark it for destruction. So, so the, the goal is to, um, uh, to synthesize this protein in a cell and get the cell to show that to your Im immune system. And so they took, um, so this, the spike protein actually binds to a, a receptor on your cells called ACE2. So in your lungs, if you breathe in the virus, that virus attaches, the spike protein attaches to the ACE2 receptor and on the cell, and that's how it gets into the cell. So the spike protein is targeting a certain protein in your lungs and then, or in your nose sometimes, your olfactory glands. Uh, or in your olfaction system, and uh, it infects that cell, and then it turns into a factory making uh, lots of new uh, viral particles. So anyway, the, the, they know the genome for um, SARS-CoV-2 is sequenced, and this is the gene for the uh, spike protein. And so basically what they have done is to take the gene for the spike protein, and they cut it out of the virus, and they uh, took this, um, this is called an expression vector, which I'll explain. Uh, and it's actually just a DNA molecule. It's a circular DNA molecule. And this circular DNA molecule has lots of little bells and whistles. It's been uh, engineered uh, very highly. And uh, it has a, an MCS or multiple cloning site. So you can, so and I've done this. I've, put, I've cut genes out and put them into expression vectors and made RNA just like this. And it's, it's really easy to do. Uh, if I can do it. <laughs> it's pretty, so you, you cut it, uh, put glue the, uh, the gene in. First time I, I did this, I put clone the gene in the wrong direction. So I had to cut it out and turn it around, reclone it in the right direction. Uh, and, and when you do that, then uh, you have a molecule that is a template, a DNA template that you can make RNA from. And so that's what they do. They take this uh, uh, molecule, put it in a test tube uh, with uh, ribonucleotides. These are the precursors that uh, line up to make an RNA molecule. RNA polymerase is the enzyme that, that, that reads off the gene and synthesizes the, um, the RNA. Uh, you have buffer, and in a one hour, 37 degrees, you have a, a, a ton of RNA uh, that you synthesize for the, for the spike protein. And so that's what they did. And this paper by Weissman uh, describes uh, the technology, so it's a, it's a great paper. Um, so for, a, uh, for example, a five liter bioreactor um, can produce almost a million mRNA vaccine doses uh, in, um, in a single reaction. So this is like maybe one or two hours. So instead of growing viruses up in eggs over months and months and months, you clone the gene into this expression vector and make tons of RNA, make a lot of it, and you can do whatever you want to. And it's also nice because you, if you, if the, when the virus mutates, you can change, a single nucle change the nucleotides in a day and remake it again, so you, you can turn it around very quickly. And, and because this is an RNA molecule that gets into cells, uh, it, it doesn't integrate into the genome. So other uh, DNA-based vaccines will integrate into the genome, which can cause cancer. The gene jumps into another gene. Uh, and so this one doesn't integrate at all, so it's, it's really uh, very, very safe. So, uh, so when, when um, viruses enter cells, if they have they contain RNA, They're, and this is supposed to be a representation of a cell, uh, and, and these little hook things are, are called uh, toll receptors. And uh, it, it actually there's a backstory. Toll, um, uh, Christian Nusslein Volhard um, discovered in fruit flies, uh, it's a developmental gene called toll. She won the Nobel Prize for, for toll. So toll's showing back up again in, in the Sith. So, so what toll does is it um, can bind to viral uh, RNAs, uh, and degrade them. And so, so that's, that's why it's very, RNA is very unstable. If it gets into a cell, it's greeted by these toll receptors, so there's no way you're going to be able to make an mRNA vaccine that's going to work. Right? Um, but that's, that's where these guys uh, uh, took a very new approach. And uh, what, they, what they based their approach on was the fact that um, uh, normal messenger RNAs inside of a cell um, are, are actually quite modified, and, and they're very different than the RNA you would find in a virus. So, so what they did was, they, uh, in their expression vectors, 
they uh, made uh, RNA molecules that, that look like this. So this is a typical messenger RNA that you would find in a cell. It has a, a structure called a five prime cap on translated region. This is, this, this is gonna be the spike protein as an open reading frame. Then a poly A tail, a string of A's at the end of the, uh, of the three prime part of the messenger RNA. So, so those, those are actually moderately stable in a cell and don't provoke the immune system. So what uh, uh, Weissman and Carrico did was they took their RNA that they made in the test tube or in a bioreactor, uh, added a five prime cap to the molecule, and they made the coding sequence so it also had a poly A tail, and they used modified nucleotides that um, um, m most messenger RNAs have. So, so typically in a cell then, the RNA that is made is very different than the RNAs that you would make in, in a test tube, but these guys uh, uh, use tricks to cap it, to make a, a modified RNAs in the middle of it. So this actually is very stable and the immune system doesn't see it. So, so what happens then is that um, it's the, the other, and, uh, like Ken was referring to, that uh, it's, uh, there are many other people that contributed to this sort of technology. And the last sort of uh, contribution is that they took these uh, messenger RNA molecules that they made in these big bioreactors and uh, coated them with, with lipids. So they made these what are called lipid nanoparticles. So up in the top left uh, is a nanoparticle that has messenger RNA inside of it, and it's protected by all these different types of lipids. So these lipids are kind of coating the messenger RNA molecule, so you can actually then shoot into a person's arm this um, messenger RNA molecule for the spike protein that's coated with nanoparticles, and then, uh, and then that nanoparticle can be taken up by the cell, and then the cell looks at that uh, messenger RNA and says, ah, that's, I know what to do with this, and it, it translates the, the RNA to make protein, and so now we have spike protein that's, that's being synthesized. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein uh, that's made from the messenger RNA and they stick it out, the, the protein gets uh, uh, displayed on the cell membrane, the immune system sees it, and so your um, immune system cells start making antibodies, and then, then, that's, and then you're vaccinated, okay? So, so then you, you're, you're primed so that uh, if you do get exposed to the real thing, uh, then you can actually um, uh, make enough antibodies quick enough to actually prevent being sick from it. So, so typically vaccines, whether it's grown in chicken eggs or, or whatever, uh, you can uh, give a, a person a vaccine. It's not gonna make them sick. Uh, it might make their immune system riled up. Um, if, you get, if your immune system gets provoked, you'll make these cytokines that make you feel sick. And they make you feel sick so you'll lay down and take it easy, right? Um, so, so you may feel that your immune system are making those molecules, but you're not really infected. And so, because it can infect, it's a dead, it's a dead virus or else this one is a messenger RNA which can't code for the virus. So you make an immune response and then uh, and when you uh, clear the, um, the vaccine out of your system, which you do with antibodies, then what happens is you have these memory cells that are left over. And that's the key to a vaccine is these memory cells are there, they're sitting there waiting to get their chance. So if you're exposed to the real virus, then look what happens, you very quickly within few hours, you make way more antibodies uh, on the second response because all those memory cells are sitting there waiting for their chance. And so they make tons of antibodies. That's what protects you. That's why uh, you could go in and uh, be exposed to COVID and not get it because your, your immune system uh, is primed. And so, uh, so I, I'm going to teach mRNA vaccines from now on, and uh, I, I, uh, um, I, I look forward to seeing the, the new uh, um, in, uh, discoveries that will make this even better. But this is why you can make it fast, cheap, uh, and, and, it's, and it's very effective. So, any questions for me? So let's see. Questions at the end, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So, oops. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. <laughs> that, that's that's this one. So, uh, right. So I I will be talking about the Nobel Prize in Physics. So as per the Nobel Committee uh, press release uh, that uh, 
uh, happened on October 3rd, uh, last month, uh, it was awarded to three physicists, uh, uh, French-born Pierre Agostini, who is now uh, a professor at the Ohio State University, uh, Ferenc, uh, Ferenc uh, Krauss, who's now working at the Max Planck uh, Institute of Quantum Optics, uh, he's from Hungary ori originally, and also French-born uh, Anne Luyriere. Uh, it's a bit hard for me to pronounce her last name, but I hope that, uh, uh, so I'm not going to offend her by that. So she's now at, uh, in Sweden at London University. So uh, this uh, Nobel Prize was given by, uh, for uh, experimental methods that generate out-of-second pulses of light for the study of electron dynamics in matter. So now, why is it uh, important? Well, if you uh, start thinking about how we actually study the world, or the world around us, so one of the main methods that we apply is observation. So we are born as uh, you know, children, so and we started uh, looking around us, we started being interested in different objects, and pretty much the same happened to uh, our species from the beginning of time. So uh, when uh, we were cavemen, uh, you can you know, you probably remember those from the history courses, all these uh, caveman drawings on the walls of caves, uh, and that was uh, one of these first uh, methods of uh, human beings to understand the world around us, right? So there would be, the picture would be drawn on the wall, and uh, I mean, you can imagine that uh, one of these, uh, you know, one of these guys would explain the other guy uh, what he drew here and what uh, they saw they happened to see in nature. And uh, what I think is that if a Nobel Prize would exist back, back then, then these kind of drawings would uh, definitely deserve one. But you know, for, uh, Nobel Prize happened uh, a lot uh, later after that, and uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's really uh, now been given for uh, something that we consider to be a very modern uh, technology and advances in science. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, if we take the paradigm, paradigm of uh, observing the world, then as uh, uh, humanity, so we, uh, we uh, developed many different tools to do that. And uh, of course, like one of them is uh, sophisticated telescopes that we use to observe objects that are very far from us and uh, that they help us to see the uh, universe, universe uh, a lot farther than uh, our own solar system, right? So uh, this is the drawing, I mean, this is a picture here of this newest uh, web telescope that NASA uh, put in space, I think last year, right? So I think time flies quickly, so probably last year. And uh, so this serves us to uh, understand uh, you know, all the physics that are happening uh, very far away from us with objects that are very large. Uh, we also developed uh, very sophisticated tools to observe the very small objects. And here uh, on that picture, uh, it's an example of uh, what's called transition electron microscope. And this kind of microscope serves us to observe the objects that are tiny on nanometer scale, just like uh, uh, Ken showed you of these uh, pictures uh, in his presentation. Uh, so uh, they help us to see the small objects, but um, really the problem is when you, uh, yeah, I uh, need to put a disclaimer here, my animations here might be a little bit glitchy. So, uh, but, so the problem here that we are, when we start going into the small objects is that we um, deal with uh, the objects that move really, really fast. So uh, here uh, on this slide, i uh, supposed to have a hummingbird, the sort of, uh, you know, flies in the space, and if you, saw, if you saw one in the real life, you remember that you are not really capable to see those uh, wings uh, separately, very, you know, uh, precisely, right? Because they just move too fast for you to, for your eye to see those. Uh, and the same thing happens at the nanoscales, at the small scale, so, and uh, therefore one of the challenge to um, sort of understand um, this kind of world uh, in uh, the world of atoms, world of molecules, is to uh, really develop a method that can capture these images uh, at a very fast rate. And what I mean by that is that if you have a very slow camera, then the object appears really blurry. So you probably saw some kind of soccer players or football players that run really fast and then those kind of images that show them to be blurry in there, right? If the camera is a lot faster, then of course the object will appear uh, a lot more uh, sharp. So, and that was the challenge uh, that uh, this Nobel Prize uh, is addressed for. So they were able to uh, sort of come up with a method that would uh, uh, be able to capture the dynamics of electrons in atoms uh, very, very fast. So, uh, 
to show that, uh, I mean, I can just uh, sort of show you a uh, kind of animation of an atom. We know that atom consists of nucleus, uh, and uh, there is electrons kind of like moving around these atoms very quickly. So uh, the time scale with which those um, electrons move is uh, lying in the range of the attoseconds. So therefore, if uh, we are to find a method that is capable of depicting this, then we have to sort of uh, create these short pulses of atom second length such that we can capture those atoms moving, right? Uh, those electrons moving. Um, so how was it, uh, right, so uh, this is just so kind of like for uh, reference, uh, what is the other second? So the other second is uh, 10 to the minus 18 uh, seconds. Uh, it's a very, very small number. If you compare that to the, uh, to the uh, universe age, so universe age is 13.8 billion years, and this is only 10, 10 to the 17 seconds. Uh, so that means that uh, we are uh, talking about really uh, short times, and what happens is that it really, like, uh, the, the challenge was such that uh, many physicists back in the 80s and 70s didn't even believe that it's possible to create because it was not quite clear how we can squeeze in the uh, light pulse such that it's going to be such short, uh, such sh short, uh, uh, such short time. So uh, then, uh, this is where uh, actually uh, Professor Luyer uh, came in play, and she said, "Like I can do that by uh, considering uh, the so by considering the uh, electron." that leaves around that atom, I showed you a couple slides back, and if I shine an infrared light at, it, uh, at this atom, so the electric field that is contained in the infrared light will start shaking the electron and move it in sort of away and back uh, to the nuclear of uh, that atom. So by that what happens is that you sort of let, add a little bit of energy for that electron to move away, uh, but then uh, when the electron goes back to nuclear, uh, if the energy of the light isn't like, kind of uh, large enough to actually push it away from that nuclear. So if you do that, then uh, you will create a short uh, wavelength pulses. So, and this idea lies uh, in the heart of the attosecond science. So uh, I put here the year, so this idea uh, was um, developed in her laboratory back in 1987, and actually took the whole uh, 14 years to uh, push that idea further. So, because the problem that she challenged in 1987 was that, uh, yes, you are capable of creating these short pulses, but they actually are not very much coherent, meaning that those pulses shooting with a different wavelength, and uh, so you needed to really think about the set of parameters uh, such that you can uh, sort of combine them together and get the uh, shorter pulses. So, uh, this is where these two other gentlemen, so they, uh, Came, came up with an idea how to do that. So basically you have a set of those wavelengths and uh, what you do is like you need to find certain conditions at which when you, uh, you know, sum or add up all of these uh, waves together, uh, you know, like when you add, for example, the peak of one wave with the deep of the other one, so what you get is basically nothing, right? But when you add the peak with the peak, then you get the enhancement of the overall signal. Uh, and uh, so they kind of were able, so they managed to uh, understand such set of parameters uh, such that at certain condition, you get this enhancement that is uh, of very, very short uh, uh, time. And uh, this kind of video, uh, video shows that uh, idea in place. So you, you see that the, right, so those waves, they come all together and at certain point, they create that little, uh, that little peak that uh, has a very short life, uh, a very short uh, time, uh, time, uh, time scale. So yeah, they applied that ideas, and uh, so Professor um, Agostini uh, managed to create a set of these pulses of the auto second length of, I think, 250 auto seconds. And uh, Professor uh, uh, Ferenc Krauss, uh, so he came up with an idea how to actually isolate a single pulse of an at a second, uh, second length. So yeah, uh, now you have a tool at your disposal that you can use to image the dynamics of those fast moving electrons around the nuclear. Uh, so, and this my last slide here, so basically, oh, one moment. Uh, okay, it's supposed to kind of move, I think, but uh, in any case, so uh, basically, so you have that kind of cloud, uh, the green, green cloud here depicts the, 
sort of electron density, and uh, so it's uh, basically with these short pulses you are capable of sort of imaging this uh, uh, density of electrons around uh, even uh, nuclei uh, in the molecular. So, yeah, this is what. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's basically my last slide anyway, so <laughs> I was just, uh, yeah, I was just uh, trying to, uh, for some reason it's uh, not working the animation, but basically I was uh, trying to show you that you can sort of understand where this electron density is located uh, in the case of a given molecule, and uh, that kind of bring our broader ability from like drawing these uh, caveman drawings right down to that we can see the dynamics of, a, of a electrons in, in, the, in the atom. So this is what the Nobel Prize was given for uh, this year. I think this is a really, really important advancement uh, and especially taking the uh, whole history of us as humankind uh, observing the world around us. So this is a definitely a breakthrough that uh, deserves to be uh, uh, recognized by a Nobel Prize. So yeah, thank you. So let's open it. Uh, let's open it up for questions. Okay. And you can ask anybody questions. So quantum dots, vaccines, or uh, atom seconds. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> let you. Well, oh, I have a question for you. Yeah. We saw some of the real life applications for the other two. Yeah. But what would a real life application yeah. be used for the physics? Um, yeah, so that's a sort of um, a good question. So because uh, this method uh, allows to uh, understand, uh, so uh, this method method allows to understand um, electron dynamics of very complex systems. Uh, so sometimes it's not, uh, but like you know, there's no probably a direct uh, application that I can think of right now, but. Uh, through that method, we can understand better some solid-state solid systems that may serve a purpose of, uh, you know, that can find its applications in uh, things like uh, quantum computations, uh, things like uh, quantum Space computations. travel. Well, I'm not sure about that, so okay. is there any <laughs> real research on, like, uh, entanglement? <laughs> At the other second. I'm not, yeah, I'm not quite sure about that. Okay. But basically, yeah, so it's, it's really a powerful tool that allows us to see uh, things like of uh, physics in uh, certain very important limits. Like, for example, when you have uh, so called strong electronic interactions where uh, you have a collection of the electrons uh, interacting with each other, this usually leads to the emergence of novel phenomena that are. Uh, have potential applications in uh, future future technology. So, but this is up. Yeah, this will uh, this will see. Yeah, Nobel, Nobel Prize is given for fundamental uh, research. Uh, <laughs> mostly for prime electron microscopy. For prime electron microscopy, that they are trying to use evidence because essentially looking at uh, an electron beam, which is at a very short wavelength, right? Uh, well, it's still light, so it's a UV light. Yeah, UV light. Yes, yeah, UV light at a very short wavelength. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say, I would say, um, yeah, I would say that. So it's a, it's a short pulse of light that allows to uh, see the electron dynamics. Well, us. Right. But, but we can apply for, of course, it's up to us which system we want to, uh, we want to look at. I mean, there's some application in organic molecules, so we can observe uh, kind of like uh, instantaneous state of that organic molecular and uh, understand the dynamics of electrons there. But yeah, it's, it's, it's we will see. So I think it's still uh, in the future. So, question of quantum dots. So. Sure. So you said that you could arrange these in any way you want, right? So is there like principle of self-organization that plays in that? Okay, so uh, you can organize the dots, but I would liken it to organizing billiard balls. So if you have balls that are all the same size, they're going to tend to sort of close back. That means you get these sort of like here, 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 and this sort of like hexagonal shape. And that's what you saw in the photos that right. you saw earlier. Right to control the actual position beyond that, you know, the sort of natural tendency to organize is very, very difficult. So that is, I can't make 
you know, out of balls, you know, something that looks like a rectangle or something that looks like Mickey Mouse. Right. That's much harder. So you can try to do things like merge, you know, things with DNA and use DNA as a template to sort of move things, if it, you know, or proteins. D does that make sense? You could use other things to try to move the particles in a way that is not natural. So there's no there's no phenomenon of self organization or anything like that. No, the dots the dots themselves they undergo what's called van der Waals. They have these van der Waals interactions, and they'll just tend to pack like pack billiard right, balls. Okay. Oh, sure. Uh, I'm fine with that. Um, so with the down conversion of photon energy um, when it's absorbed and re emitted, uh, does the difference in energy just go into heat then, basically? Um, yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. So. What happens is that the, in the TV, the blue light gets absorbed by the quantum dots. Let's assume that you have a green emitter, right? So it goes from blue light to green light, and all that excess energy actually goes as heat. Okay. So it's a, it's a very good one. That's very insightful. Yeah. Did, did you know that you can actually try to do what's called up conversion? No. So you can actually go the other way. This is something that I've been working on. <laughs> so so <laughs> advertising here. You can go below the gap, that is, if you have a green emitter, you can excite with an energy lower than the green, let's say red light, it can interact with the material, and it can go up in energy, and then you can get green light by putting in red light. The difference in energy is not heat, it's actually heat taken away, right, from the material, and actually you can use light to cool matter. So would you believe if I shine light on a piece of semiconductor, I could in principle cool it? Like you would have a refrigerator without having this sort of like freon or sort of a coolant flowing through it. So that's something that I'm working on, but you're absolutely right that that's a very insightful question. Heat is generated when you go down. Would they use that kind of thing for processing? So I remember people like, like trying to create nanoprocessors and everything was always over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you pack, when you if you if you got if you're a gamer and you put like uh, the biggest processor possible, I mean it's gonna get hot. So you put a fan, or you might even dunk your CPU inside a big fish tank full of a non-aqueous solvent that just keeps it cold, right? So the U.S. military, like the Air Force, which has funded some of this research, really wants to use this laser cooling to cool things like, you know chips and stuff like that. So you can use a little LED or light to cool matter. So you could cool computer chips just as well. So Intel could use this in principle. But this is a pipe dream, right? I mean, no one's shown it, I don't think. So anyway, thank you. Kirk, are they looking into using this technology for other um, vaccines like the influenza or um, I, as I understand it and my understanding is limited to what I see on the Today Show, um, <laughs> I, the, the common cold is also a coronavirus, is that? Yeah, colds are rhinovirus. Or there, there are other coronaviruses oh, yeah. out there that this could be used for, does it, or does it have to be the corona kind of, okay. No, they, you're absolutely right. This is sort of a um, kind of, I think the future of vaccines because you can make them so fast and right. so pre precise. Um, the coronaviruses, um, SARS, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, was actually uh, an epidemic uh, back at early 2000s, uh, but it didn't circulate very far, so it didn't go pandemic. Uh, then a related coronavirus is called MERS, or Middle East mm -hmm. Respiratory Syndrome, and that was also a short-lived epidemic. And then this is a second <coughs> SARS, and it did epidemic, then it jumped to pandemic. So for sure, any of those coronaviruses, they, they could use it for. But uh, the, the, every s different virus has its problems. Like rhinovirus, there's about 170 of those different rhinoviruses. So how so that becomes a problem. You, they're trying to make a polyvalent one that has, instead of four, like the, the influenza, that has 170 uh, ones in that. But that's, that's not here yet. Uh, the um, the uh, influenza virus, um, the polymerase makes mistakes and so it mutates constantly. And so that virus is always changing, changing, changing. The HIV virus um, mutates also very quickly uh, and uh, evolves even in a single patient. So, so there's some that aren't going to, that vaccines are, are very difficult to make for, like HIV or, or cold viruses. But then there's a whole slew of others, uh, Ebola. 
um, Zika, um, uh, any of the uh, um, flavor viruses, the uh, yellow virus, the uh, um, um, so so yeah, the, uh, many many different viruses could be um, you could make vaccines against them using this, yeah. and that's what they're going to do. <laughs> I mean, especially when you said that they could kind of change it easily. Yeah, in a day. In a day or I so. mean, I, and I, I assume that's like the different strains of yeah. COVID that, that were going around. Okay, let's change the, the, the vaccine and do a booster yeah, that's on what that. Yeah, so. we got the booster too right. for, for COVID, and that was a changed <laughs> one. Yeah, so it's a different it Because it seems like if you could do that for influenza, if you got it wrong and had the wrong four and there was another one, you could change it quickly and, yeah. yeah. Other questions? Everything about atoms, seconds and quantum <laughs> dots. And this was a small, this was the year of small, at least mm -hmm. for uh, the Nobel Prizes in the science areas. I have a question on the out of seconds one. Was that last slide that you had up with the green cloud, was that like a true photo or um, is that uh, possible? Well, it's, it wasn't a true photo, so okay. it was uh, it was a... Uh, 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 water? Water? Maybe water, I don't know. But anyway, so yeah, it's, it's just an example. So I mean, really, uh, it's something I found uh, searching online. Uh, yeah. So what people model it, but it's a model. So of course, it's not... Like the problem is like uh, when you go to uh, work um, and try to understand the dynamics of something small, uh, you start hitting the limits of the quantum mechanics, right? So uh, that representation that was a few slides back where you saw like all these electrons moving around the atoms, it's not a real thing, right? And uh, when you, um, the quantum mechanics tells us that there is an uncertainty principle uh, where if I am to find uh, the, for example, the position of the particle, then the more precise I try to measure the position of a particle, then the less precise I can measure the velocity of that particle. Same applies for, for example, time uh, and position, time and energy. Uh, and uh, that is applied here. So if I am to measure the electrons, I can't really measure a single electron and its position in a single particular point in space. What I can rather measure is a kind of cloud. So it's the probability of where that electron can be. And this green cloud here is uh, kind of showing that probability. The other second pulses and uh, uh, microscopy can actually kind of show that. So, okay. But it cannot really tell you, like, okay, I know that my electron is located exactly here uh, in space. And that's just way higher probability than was ever possible before in terms of guessing that? Thing. Yeah, so if, if it's like a fact, like, you know, at a second is uh, uh, one before, like, three uh, orders of magnitude before the femtoseconds, which okay. were around a lot longer because this is uh, based basically on those addition of uh, longer wavelength. So, uh, and they were able just to see kind of like uh, an average position, right? So it's not like instantaneous way to observe this uh, electron density, but rather like averaged uh, over time. So with other seconds, of course, it started, it started to kind of see like where the probability at this given moment is more compared to the previous moment. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah, uh, is there any like, other physical process that has a time scale even faster than out of seconds that maybe um, for the future Nobel Prize uh, <laughs> 20 30 years <laughs> well okay so first of all you see it's called out of seconds right but what we have so far I think the best is like 100 ish out of seconds so yeah there's still of course there's still room to, to improve that so uh, and uh, uh, my understanding of this problem, so I just uh, uh, want to say that uh, my understanding of this problem is that it's probably uh, really about finding the correct set of parameters and ex experimental, um, you know, those gases that you use, the mixtures that you use to produce those short pulses that I showed you, uh, like on that kind of infrared uh, irradiated, you know, chamber. Uh, so. Is there an improvement? Uh, sure, I mean, you know, there is uh, still kind of, well, I can think of these electrons as indivisible uh, particles. Uh, however, we know that uh, high energy uh, physics has observed uh, a lot smaller particles with, uh, uh, you know, and there's uh, some uh, theories of the quark gluon plasma, so other like little uh, uh, smaller particles which might have a different time scale. 
So there's, there is room for improvement uh, taking that. However, of course, it's a lot challenging because even, you know, when you come from this breakthrough and people say you cannot do that, right? And then eventually you come up with an idea that actually breaks that barrier. So it becomes a huge uh, break, breakthrough for all, for all of us uh, and our understanding. Um, and uh, what I can say is that the farther you go, the more harder it's to do. So we'll see. I'm sure that it will be, but I don't know if we, it will be in our, in our lifetime. So hopefully, hopefully, yeah. Deb, I have a question about the Nobel Prize in general, maybe you know or don't know. Do they reserve the right to not give it in a given year? Yes. Nothing happened in physics this year? Uh, yeah, so it's not necessarily, so most of the years that it hasn't been awarded was during World War One and World War II. Okay. People were okay. busy, yeah. but, um, <laughs> But, but doing great things in physics. And yes, yeah. but so so there have not been Nobel Prizes awarded in every category every year if it wasn't deemed possible. The other thing that's interesting, once you get nominated for a Nobel Prize, that's kept secret for 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, so people get nominated every year. So in these each of these categories, about 3,000 people were nominated in each of those categories. And people can be nominated multiple years, and they can be nominated multiple times. Some people have been lucky. So the person who developed insulin, um, they got it. The they were nominated one year by three different people, and they got it in the first year. The person who discovered tuberculosis and uh, understanding that disease got nominated 55 times over the course of four years and then finally was. So that was uh, Robert Koch. So anyway, uh, yeah, so it's a process. And it's very secret. So anybody who got nominated this year, we won't know till 50 years from now. Can you yeah. describe just briefly the process and funding? The whole Nobel, um... So the funding comes from Alfred Nobel. So when he died, he left the majority of his estate to start this prize. And e each year, the prize is awarded from the interest earned on his money. He was very wealthy. Um, the, but the amount fluctuates. So what I found interesting is that last year it was less. I guess the interest rates weren't as good. This year they're getting a little bit more. Um, so, so the funding comes from him, except for the economics prize, which comes from the Swedish bank. But the economics prize, that wasn't started till 1968. So it's the original five Nobel prizes that are funded by Alfred Nobel from his estate money. Um, in terms of how they do it each year, um, I, I mainly know the sciences. So in the sciences, they put together a panel of experts in physics, chemistry, and physiology, and medicine. That panel is secret. And so we don't know who was on that panel. Um, and they then sift through these 3,000 nominations. Um, so people get nominated, and then they sift through that. They make a decision. And this is, takes over a year for this process. So this September, uh, people were being nominated, but it won't be announced till next October who actually got the award. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty secret. So, yeah. so the funding is, includes uh, a compensation for the panel and, and all the administrative stuff. I think so. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Swedish government um, I think might fund some of this. So, for example, actually, the first week in November, starting December seventh. All of the Nobel Prizes, the people who won Nobel Prizes will be giving talks, and they will be streamed live. So I just checked. So if you go to the Nobel Prize website, starting December 7th, they'll start streaming the talks. So if you want to hear from the people who actually won the award, you have to be alive to get the Nobel Prize. Uh, that was the other thing that I forgot to mention. To, to be eligible, yes. Yeah. It could happen. So, uh, so anyway, they will be giving their talks in December. So the big celebration is actually in, in December. So your very first slide introducing Alfred Nobel mm -hmm. showed dynamite. Yes. Is that I, he discovered dynamite? Is it That's true one of the things. Yes. The toning for that development <laughs> and its uh, impact on the world. Yes. And then left this prize. Yes. Money and he had a guilty conscience. Yeah. So about five years before he died, his brother died. 
but it was mistaken and somehow they thought he died. So an obituary came out about him and it said that he was one of the worst human beings on the planet. I'm paraphrasing slightly, but it was like that. And it kind of shocked him into what legacy am I leaving? And so he changed his will. And, um, and so he changed his will to honor specifically uh, rewarding or uh, recognizing um, work that has significantly contributed to people. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, let's thank our panel one more time. And we have some really fabulous talks coming up. So really quickly. So on December 1st, there's going to be the Christmas lecture. This happens at the um, University of, on the Notre Dame campus in Jordan Hall of Science. This is free and open to everyone. It's going to be chemistry this year. It looks like it might be fire related. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, so Dr. Kate uh, Bieberdorf, um, she's a chemist, a science entertainer, and a professor. Um, and she does a very theatrical lecture. This is geared for kids all the way on up. Um, and so this is uh, 7 to 9 on Friday, open to everybody. Um, and then our next Universe Revealed lecture series is going to be Ryan Olivier. Um, he is an assistant professor of physics at IU South Bend. Um, and he's going to be talking about, he's a composer, um, and he's a multimedia uh, artist. So he composes music, but then also puts together visual images with that music. And so he's going to be talking about how do you think about geometry in this case and sound and putting that together. Mm -hmm. um, and then in January and February, uh, we have Maggie Fink is going to be talking about the secret social life of bacteria. They make friends, they have wars. Anyway, we'll see what all they do. Um, and then Kyle Schweiderman will be talking about the mathematics of origami. This is a hands-on one. We are going to be folding. So anyway, those are things that are coming up. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And uh, with that, we'll end.